We have with us David Purcell that was just on a very interesting panel uh, looking at the financial side of the market but also peeking into uh, maybe some of the reasons for the whole shale boom in the U.S. and where we are in the process and what's going to happen next. Um, David, we were talking before and we heard from uh, uh, His Excellency, the oil minister of Saudi Arabia, that um, it all happened because of $100 oil, new technology, and we found something that we didn't know about. Uh, what's your reaction to that? So I, I think $100 oil certainly helped accelerate, but look, we, we've known that, that those resources have been there. We've been drilling through these resources for tens, if not f at least 50 years. What happened was the ability to take horizontal well technology, which is not new, and hydraulic fracturing technology, which is not new, but marry those two so that you can, we, we can put 30 or 40 or 50 frack stages along a, a five or 10,000 foot horizontal section. And what that does, it, it, it opens up a vast resource of, or a vast quantity of new resource. Mm -hmm. It's lower quality rock, but you've, you've taken the hydrocarbon risk out of it. You know, 15 years ago, it was a seismic driven um, industry. And so the, the catchphrase was hard to find, easy to produce. If you could, if you could find it on your seismic, it was gonna be in a great, great quality reservoir. You drill it and, and you produce it. So it was very geologic and geophysically driven. Today, it's much more about the engineering and the, the, the completion engineering of this, right? Where do you land the lateral? Where do you, you put your, your, you know, how do you frack it? How many stages do you need? What does hydraulic fracture stimulation look like? And so what that's actually done, because there's a, a much larger quantity of this re resource, EMP companies can actually plan uh, five years or 10 years down the road. They, they know they've got inventory where, again, back in the seismically dominated days, a company might have a year and a half's worth of drillable inventory and so now it's, it's a game changer because it's gone from hard to find, easy to produce, easy to find, hard to produce. And, and it, it really wasn't a revolutionary technology. It was an evolution of, of piecing different pieces of technology together. I think we heard yesterday on hydraulic fracturing, I think, I think uh, Ryan Lance said we're in the third inning mm -hmm. of fracture stimulation. I think we're probably, I'd argue, fifth or sixth inning, but we still have a lot of optimization left. Uh, in, in, in the way the wells are being completed. Mm -hmm. And David, in fact, brought this point home when they, he mentioned that uh, when you talk about using more sand, he said, welcome to 1983. So yeah. um, this is old technology being used maybe in a new way. Uh, one of the things that we heard yesterday from Scott Sheffield, which I've heard many times, but uh, is that he's aiming at resources that are very close to the pipe. So they're fracking very hard in a, in a fairly small yeah. annulus around it rather than trying to get out to other areas. Do you think that that's a correct strategy? I, I, I think it is um, because what you're trying to do is, is if, you, if you put a handful of very long hydraulic fractures out, I'm going to talk with my hands here so it'll okay. be difficult. But if those fracks are too far apart, there's a big area of undrained reservoir in between. So one of the reasons folks are coming in with more frack stages and more perforation clusters, and they, they talk about trying to break up the rock. Effect, mm -hmm. What you're trying to do is affect more individual hydraulic fractures along that, that hydraulic along that horizontal lateral so that you're, you're affecting more reservoir. And that gives you better effective drainage around that horizontal lateral. So you may not be draining as far into the reservoir, but it should increase recovery factors near the reservoir. So I think that's the right strategy. It's much harder to do in practice because mm -hmm. you're, you're, we're doing this blind and it's still, again, there's still some, some things that uh, we have yet to do. Uh, is an industry to standardize and, and really optimize that process. You came across as a bit of a pessimist on the Eagleford. Yes. And uh, the one thing that you didn't say, which I think many of us think, is that the high grading uh, has been responsible uh, more than 
how you know the technology, what you're doing, it's what you're doing it to that matters. And they yeah. they pretty much bled out the Kynes trough, and then it gets pretty thin because uh, it's much thinner stand, and it's not it's not the multiple zones that you get in both the Permian and the stack and scoops and stuff like that. Is that an accurate? Uh, I, I think, and so we we've had very steep decline rates. Our our type curves in the Eagle Ford were probably as pessimistic as as anybody on the street. Mm -hmm. And wells are actually underperforming our fairly pessimistic view, and there's there's two reasons for that, and and it, it really we're actually in the middle of trying to understand this, and it may not be across the play, but there's there's two things that can be happening here. One, either the wells were drilled too close together, mm -hmm. and so you have drainage, so the the, the wells are competing, and what that allows is you don't have that nice shallow 5% terminal decline mm -hmm. or there's a retrograde condensate issue and that's possible where liquids are actually dropping out in the reservoir and now you have two-phase flow and a tight rock that impedes flow and so you know your listeners just went to sleep with that <laughs> conversation mm -hmm. but it, it's it's technically a very controversial um, I issue is to is it retrograde condensate is it well spacing and for us it's important to know because the Eagleford was developed very quickly before you knew what the optimal well spacing was or if we really knew that retrograde condensate might or might not be an issue. So to figure that out is important because you're going to see the same sort of r rapid development in parts of the Delaware Basin and parts of the Midland Basins in West Texas. We want to make sure that we understand what happened in the Eagleford is a a bit of a laboratory to make sure we don't see those mistakes made again in West Texas. Well, the other thing is that God knew what he was doing when he selected the Eagleford to put a bunch <laughs> of shale in because he's right next to the main customers, the refineries along the coast. He's in an incredibly friendly area yeah. in a friendly state. Uh, and there's a huge talent base there. Plus, there's money right there as well. Uh, so that's all great. And that's what I think is wrong, and you can agree or disagree with the Bakken. It's in the wrong place, it, and it's being shut in because of, purely because of freight costs, and it's it's also not shale, but that's a different thing. Yeah, yeah. well, the, the the tight oil nature of the Bakken is we think that by 2020 we're probably out of core inventory, mm -hmm. so inventory depth is becoming an issue for some of those companies again, which is, you know, 15 years ago if you had four or five years of inventory that would have been fantastic. Yeah. Now it's like, well, you need to add some more. Um, inventory on. And so we think the Bakken is challenged longer term. There's still some good areas, but it's harder to make a company there now mm -hmm. than it is in the in the Permian or and, and I'd say the Eagleford is is actually from a performance standpoint actually stands behind the Bakken. So what what does West Texas have has those same attributes as the Eagleford. Friendly state, easy to put infrastructure in the ground, a little farther from market, but still, it's not hard to lay a pipeline from Midland right. to Corpus or Midland to Houston. So, and and, and the, the and you don't cross any state lines. Don't cross any state lines, and it's, it's all about the pipes. And it's pretty well desert. Um, the the other thing that is interesting about uh, the West Texas uh, uh, development is it's very gassy. And that gas has a lot of liquids to it. And so when we think about the beneficiaries of that, it's, it's really the, the petrochemical industry on the, on the upper Texas and Louisiana Gulf Coast. And, and the U.S. should be in an uh, advantaged uh, position as a petrochemical, uh, f for those who use NGLs as a feedstock in the petrochemical business, right. they should be. And in, if not, in, it's in the exports. There's exactly. now a, a market. Yeah. One last question. Far away. I promise. Um, people have said uh, that the Neobrara is the next uh, Permian. Uh, the Neobrara right now, as near as I can tell, is one state with one county with one field and a couple. It's a Wattenberg field in Weld County in, in the Denver, Denver Julesburg Basin. Um, it's a very geographically wide area that they call Neobrara, but it doesn't seem to be much happening in it now. Is that something that we should keep on our radar or not? I, I think you keep it on your radar screen. I think it's it's a little trickier. Reservoir quality is generally not as good as, as mm -hmm. parts of the Permian. The entry cost is lower, um, but you have Colorado surface issues. You have uh, a, a lot of things you worry about. 
with regard to hydraulic fracturing legislation and does that impact the ability to, to we thought developed. we were past that, but you never uh, we're know. Not, we're, ne yeah. we're never, yeah. never going to be past that. It's, it's going to always be an issue. Thank you very much. Thanks, David. We it's may great, have a, a smaller you. audience for this that really gets a lot out of it, yeah. but I think they really will appreciate your insights. Thank well, you. Well, thanks.